From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the ancestral homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. This season of Big Ideas focuses on sustainability and sustainable practices. True sustainability is dependent on equally balanced responses to social, economic, and environmental needs. Today's episode considers sustainable models of global economic development. My guest is economist Dr. William Easterly. Bill was raised right here in Bowling Green, Ohio, and received his BA in economics from BGSU in 1979. He spent 16 years as a research economist at the World Bank and has worked in many areas of the developing world and some transition economies in Africa, Latin America, and Russia. He is professor of economics at New York University and co-director of the NYU Development Research Institute. He's also the author of three books, including The White Man's Burden, The Elusive Quest for Growth, and The Tyranny of Experts, as well as over 60 peer-reviewed academic articles and public scholarship for The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and numerous other publications. Thanks so much for joining me today, Bill. It's a pleasure to get to talk with you. Likewise, Jolie. It's a pleasure. Can you start us off by giving us the very compressed version of how you got from being an undergrad at BGSU to working at the World Bank. What were some of those forks in the road that led you on that path? When I was in graduate school after Bowling Green, I had some a lot of friends from Mexico by kind of a strange coincidence. There are several students from Mexico in my program, and they kindly arranged for me to go visit Mexico for a year and be at a Mexican university while I was working on my dissertation, which was about Mexico. And that, that really got me really fascinated with development economic development, which I had already had some exposure to as a 12-year-old because (laughs) my father, who was a BGSU professor of of biology, he was a botanist, he got a Fulbright professorship to go to Cape Coast, Ghana, and took all of us kids along when I was 12 years old. And so maybe that had something to do psychologically with predisposing me to work on development and Africa itself later. In fact, I later went back to Ghana several times. Could you explain to our listeners, what is a development economist? What does it mean? And what were the kinds of things that you were working on for many years? Kind of sadly, the, the label that most people recognize is third world. I still find today when I'm trying to explain to people what I do that I say, I work on economic development and I get a blank stare. And then I say, oh, I work on what used to be called the third world. And I, oh, now I understand what you do. Totally. So the third world, if you don't know, was this sort of label that came along in the 1950s applied to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It was supposedly supposed to be the idea that there are the first world, the, the, the U.S. and its allies, and the second world, the Soviet Union and its allies were competing for a third party, the third world. That was supposedly the non, non-hierarchical meaning of third world. But I think everybody knew right away that it was a very hierarchical meaning. So that's that's what I started working on in graduate school. And then, uh, yeah, as I said, I got really interested in doing that. So I was very lucky to get a job at the World Bank, which was the premier, was and still is the premier development institution working on developing countries. In your role as a, you know, as a research economist, what were the kinds of research? What did that actually look like in terms of, you know, the data you were collecting, who you were speaking with? Yeah, so I worked mainly on macroeconomic issues, which means things like budget deficits and inflation and foreign trade policy, exchange rate policy, all those things. And so the kind of data we usually worked with were sort of national level data to see how well a nation was doing. 
So, for example, in 1985, I went I went back to Ghana for the first time since I've been there as a 12 year old, <laughs> and uh, we were working on uh, helping Ghana kind of emerge from a period when which there had been kind of extreme persecution of anyone who was not a sort of crony of the state, and so a lot of you know non crony economic producers were being severely tortured by the state with all kinds of economic controls. Cocoa producers, for example, in, in, our, in the region around Kumasi, Ghana, a hundred miles from the coast, were growing cocoa and doing very well until the Ghanaian government decided to persecute them, partly because they were from the Ashanti ethnic group, which was not in power at the time. And that those controls really destroyed the Ashanti economy and destroyed the economy of most of Ghana. And so we're we came in in 1985 to try to help them kind of remove those controls and revive the cocoa economy. And I can't say that our efforts made any difference, made any difference but they were successful. The Ghanaian policymakers and the Ashanti cocoa producers were successful in reviving the sector. That's the kind of example of the kind of things that I worked on many times throughout my career. To oversimplify what is obviously a very complex subject, could you talk to us about some of the problems you see with the way that global aid and development happens today, especially in this kind of unequal relationship between wealthy Western nations and these other parts of the world? The label third world was kind of a hint from the beginning that it would be seen as this very paternalistic enterprise. And that is sort of, you know, I don't think the people that I knew were racists that, that I was working with at the World Bank or that I knew for otherwise in economic development. But they still kind of suffered from the kind of colonial mindset. It was we, the rich countries, the West, who had something to offer, and the the rest, <laughs> or maybe another way to divide the world is the, re the, the West and the rest, <laughs> which only makes sense from the West point of view, obviously. And uh, the West was sort of like the only hope for development of the rest. That was the, their only hope to have kind of positive economic growth out of poverty and to escape poverty. And that mindset is, is sort of what gradually came, not, I wasn't that aware of it at the beginning, but gradually throughout my career, it began to bother me more and more about what we were doing. So I think, you know, there was a sense in which, it, first of all, it wasn't working. Our, our advice was not seemingly getting the wise stuff that would get them out of poverty. And uh, second, you know, I just think it's morally wrong to violate someone else's right to self-determination, to run their own lives, to make their own democratic decisions, how they want to run their own, their own country, their own economy. And so those two things combine sort of the positive prediction that uh, aid often, very often does not work to raise material development. That's number one. And number two, that there's a kind of moral problem in aid, that it's, it's both paternalistic and coercive, that it's presuming to know best what's what other people should be doing and often using some form of coercion to enforce that you know the usual form of kind of coercion that is not a, not as bad as it used to be in colonial times but it's still bad is just to use loans from the world bank and the imf as kind of blackmail the force countries into what we think they should be doing that did not work to create either economic reform or economic prosperity and then second, I just think that it's morally kind of re re repulsive to have that mindset that uh, other people should do what I think is best for them instead of, you know, them choosing to do what's best for themselves. Well, you open the tyranny of experts with the kind of thought exercise of imagining if the kind of approach that the World Bank and other organizations take happened in Northwest Ohio and kind of the the shock and horror and repugnance that results in the reader and thinking that that's unjust, that's unfair. And yet somehow we don't feel those same things when it seems to be happening far away to those people. I imagined uh, a project in Wood County in which the World Bank would have come in and taken some Wood County farmers land at gunpoint and said, sorry, this land is no, young, no longer yours. We're going to use it to do a World Bank project, which is we think Forestry would be a better use for your land than the corn that you're growing now. So, but we're not going to give you a choice on that. We're just going to take your land and turn it over to somebody else who will do a forestry project. And then, you know, on the way out, we'll just kind of burn your homes and shoot your cattle. That, that sounds so horrific. It seems like some crazy 
apocalyptic nightmare that we would, would be completely fictional. Surely that never did happen, never would happen in Wood County, Ohio. And of course it didn't because there's still enough checks and balances to keep something like that from happening to our farmers. It actually did happen in a district called Mubende, Uganda, in the country of Uganda. A World Bank project actually did come in, did take farmers' lands at gunpoint, did shoot their cattle, did burn their homes, did turn the land over to somebody else to do a forestry project. And then, you know, sadly enough that even though that story was eventually exposed on the front page of the New York Times, it seemed like nobody really cared. Like there was, you know, this was not worth kind of getting upset about in development. I thought it was definitely worth getting upset about. <laughs> so that's the kind of problem I see with development today. We don't seem to care enough about the rights of poor people. On that question about that kind of gap between the sort of large bureaucratic systems and the experiences of local people on the ground, how do you see global aid organizations affecting local efforts to respond to given conditions or emerging crises? You know, the development agencies, the, the World Bank and the IMF, for example, especially let me use the World Bank as an example. And also we could think of USAID, the, the US Aid Agency for International Development as being in the same ballpark is they have maybe some idea that they should involve local people in in their projects. And they have this kind of awful jargon word, civil society, to refer to that, civil society in quotes. And what they mean by civil society is sort of any grassroots organization that kind of participates in aid projects and kind of helps decide what should be done in the aid project. Of course, in reality, the civil society is usually someone chosen by the World Bank itself, so it's hardly a democratic process. And usually the people they choose are the ones that are kind of the most easy to work with from a World Bank point of view, which mostly means going along with what USAID or World Bank wants. And they know that to challenge that would probably not get them the contract next time for a civil society contract. And so that's kind of the the lame attempt at involving local people in, in participation that's happening now. And I gave two examples of that. One is uh, in Afghanistan, there were civil society organizations before the end of the, the U.S. effort in Afghanistan. All along these 20 years, there have been civil society organizations. And one of the main things they complained about were actually not about development projects, but about U.S. bombing that was killing civilians in Afghanistan. That was the thing that civil society wanted to talk about in Afghanistan. And the World Bank is like, no, 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 excuse me. You should be talking about, you know, agriculture or health clinics or something. You're not allowed to talk about bombing. You know, you're not supposed to be talking about that. And so that was, uh, you know, this kind of sad non-dialogue that happened between civil society and, and the World Bank and USAID. And the second example was from Honduras, where there was a, a World Bank affiliated project that, that was sort of like the Uganda example, was a private landowner was getting World Bank loans and was using the money to hire private security forces that were driving peasants off their own land and seizing the land for the, for the rich company, Honduran company that was being run by this, this person to whom the World Bank was giving loans. And so civil society in Honduras was like, we don't want our land stolen. And by the way, if our land is being stolen, then the only best thing we have left is to migrate to the United States. So that civil society was saying, you know, we don't want our land stolen. And if things keep being as bad as they are now, we want to migrate to the United States. And again, the, the USAID was saying to them, oh no, you're not allowed to say that. Neither of those are you allowed to say. You know, whether your land is stolen is a, a side issue. And you're definitely not allowed to migrate to the United States. In fact, we want to give you aid to Honduras to keep you in Honduras on the condition that you will stay in Honduras, you know, which is kind of intrinsically insulting. Imagine uh, somebody giving a New York City, giving aid to Ohio on the condition that Ohioans not move to New York City. You know, please, we'll give you aid as long as you don't, you know, insult us with your presence here in New York City. You know, that would be pretty insulting to the people of Bowling Green. Somehow we don't think that way when it comes to giving Hondurans aid conditional on them staying in the Honduras. 
and the aid pays for things like soccer fields and you know, things like that, which I'm sure are great, but not really solving the problem. And if they say, we don't want your soccer fields, we want to migrate, then again, you know, they're not allowed to say that. So that's kind of the, the problem in aid is the poor people are not allowed to talk back. The aid beneficiaries are not allowed to talk back. We're going to take a quick break. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. If you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Dr. William Easterly about global poverty and sustainable development and aid models. Bill, in your 2013 book, The Tyranny of Experts, Economists, Dictators, and the Forgotten Rights of the Poor, you talk about the illusion that poverty springs from a shortage of expertise as opposed to a shortage of rights. Could you explain what you mean by that? And why is it so important to reframe the conversation around rights? Technocracy is a great word to describe the kind of status quo in the aid world. Technocracy means the rule of experts. <laughs> you know, the the technocrats are the experts who have kind of power, some some ruling power to make things happen. The illusion is that the problems are only technological. You know, if there's poverty, then there must be a shortage of like fertilizer for poor farmers or a shortage of high quality seeds. So if you can get the Gates Foundation just to pay for what is often called the Green Revolution in Africa, then that technological fix will get Africans out of out of poverty. And the, the list of technological fixes is like, you know, contains literally thousands of items of all the, the popular magic bullets that can can be used to kind of improve improve agriculture and health and education and infrastructure and transport and all the all these areas. It's certainly true that technology is something that does enable powerful increases in pro economic production, and uh, and that is part of the story of how to get out of poverty. But then the big question is, why are the technological fixes not there already? You know, why didn't they, if they're so wonderful, if they're such magic bullets, why aren't they there already? And the reasons are often political. Under an oppressive regime, the incentive to imitate technological solutions that are available from elsewhere is not very good because you know the oppressive regime will just seize your your output or will put you in, in prison if you're too visible or politically active or whatever. And of course, before there were today's oppressive regimes in, in many parts of Africa and Asia, there were colonial regimes. And the colonial regimes also were part of the, the story of poverty that, again, they were, they were oppressive and also destroying the incentives of local people to kind of invest in their own futures and to adopt Western technologies or be able to adopt Western technologies or, and they were not getting, the local people were not getting enough schooling and other things they needed to be able to adopt those technologies. And so the idea that technology is the story is kind of like, in the end is, is, very, is not, not at all convincing. It sounds more like the politics is usually the story. Much of your work, as you've been suggesting with some of your discussion of these kind of larger causes, your work advocates a bottom-up approach, meaning that future solutions will be found more through experimentation and dialogue with individuals and communities that need resources and other supports. Talk us through what difference that would make in this approach rather than this sort of top-down technocratic approach to problem solving. Yeah, so as an economist, I see um, you know certain kinds of mar market systems as are very, being very beneficial from the, for this regard as being a market system as a, a bottom-up system as long as there is competition and protection of the rights of, of peasants and smallholders and you know kind of equal equal legal rights for all producers in, in the economy and so you know I and so I'm very sort of market oriented as an economist which people get kind of confused by <laughs> by the kind of combination of views that, that I'm fond of myself, because people think of markets as being like a right-wing thing and of anti-colonialism and anti-racism being like a left-wing thing. And I think, I think the both go together <laughs> as being part of the kind of awareness that, that leads to solutions. You know, the markets is kind of like the most obvious kind of bottom-up system because it's sort of rewarding 
rewarding small producers like the cocoa farmer's story in Ghana with when they do find a solution for their own poverty by producing cocoa that you know they get the reward for that they they determine they, they have self determination they're determining their own choice of occupation and their own which customers to sell to and you know the prices are freely determined by competition and then of course on the consumer side it's also very much a bottom up system that the consumers get to choose what products they want even on very poor people with very limited budgets it's very important to them also to be able to choose what products they want so i think of the market as very much part of the answer of being a bottom up system then of course we also need politics to be a bottom up system which means kind of very participatory grassroots democracy that especially the the least well off but but really all all parts of the population have the ability to protest when the government is doing something bad to them the ability to demand better quality public services the ability to complain about abuses all those things sort of go together as part of a the idea of democracy that we really have which we sadly think is for some reason is not applicable to poor people that poor people don't want democracy and i think that's completely false i think Poor people want democracy just as the, as much as the rest of us do, and so I think the combination of democracy and markets is sort of what forms a kind of well well working bottom up system. But of course, the, the getting there getting there is very hard. It's not it's not easy. You know, sometimes you're limited to just saying kind of obvious but maybe useful things like maybe USAID should not support a brutal autocrat just because of the war on terror. Maybe we should you know be more sympathetic to democratic movements in poor countries instead. Yeah, so I think it gives the kind of bottom-up awareness gives you a kind of awareness of the kind of drastic, destructive, top-down things that should not happen in aid. And then on the most of the bottom-up stuff, frankly, is going to be done by poor people themselves again. I, I think, you know, all, even uh, aid critics and human rights critics should also not think of themselves as saviors. <laughs> you know, it's it's really the uh, it's really poor people who are going to save themselves. It's not. It's not some Western, say, human rights activist or economist who's going to save them by a long shot. One question I have is, what is your opinion of things like micro lending, which are kind of still involve Westerners, but usually individuals attempting to provide aid in the form of like very small lending to often individual landowners or things like that. How does that fit into kind of the landscape of development aid? Microcredit is, is an example of this, um, a large number of things which are more popular in the West than they are, than they are in poor countries. <laughs> the people in the West think microcredit is this like magical solution that sounds wonderful that you just give small loans usually uh, often targeting women and the small loans will allow the women to become entrepreneurs and lift themselves out of poverty. That's the usual kind of image that we have in microcredit. So it's a great story. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't, it's very rarely worked out that way in practice. And, that, and microcredit has been tried now for, for you know, several decades now at this point. And that, that has rarely come to pass, that kind of image of, of the transformation that would happen to microcredit. I mean, microcredit, does turn out to be useful for kind of giving more financial access to poor people. That's sort of how the way it turned out to be useful. That it's like everyone, like all the rest of us, it's helpful for poor people to have have bank accounts or to have the ability to get do financial transactions. You know, and that's something that was often not very easy for them to do with a, with a formal traditional banking system. So, I mean, the a kind of emblematic example of this is the. There's something called M-Pesa in Kenya. It started out as a microcredit thing. And as part of the microcredit thing, they gave, uh, people in Kenya gave, they gave, handed out cell phones saying, if you want to make your loan payments on the microcredit schemes, then use the cell phone to transfer small amounts of money. And so the microcredit program that that was part of actually failed. It, did, it didn't go anywhere. It was a failure as far as these hopeful images of getting women entrepreneurs to be lift themselves out of poverty in the usual story. But the accidental success was this ability, this ability to transfer money by cell phone took off like wildfire, like this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> you know, now farmers can transfer money to their su suppliers, their customers can transfer money back to the farmers. They can also use the cell phones to find out what the prices are in different markets. 
and then you know arrange transactions in those markets. And so you know unintentionally the the financial part of of microcredit turned out to be useful. But the original scheme, the the appealing kind of savior image that microcredit providers had did not did not work out. That's like I said, that's one of many examples of things that really sound good to Western NGOs and Western donors. And people love to do things that sound good, but often don't work out as well as they think they will. We've talked a lot about some of the failures of development. Can you provide maybe an example or two of a development project that really did demonstrate being in dialogue with local communities? The ones that sort of are successful involving local communities, uh, that's, a, that's a tougher one <laughs> to, to come up with success stories there. Again, you know, I, I mean, to the extent that there is some modest encouragement of democratic movements in poor countries, Western aid effort is not homogeneous either. There are parts of the Western aid effort that do care about democracy, even while other parts are giving aid to you know, brutal autocratic allies in the war on terror. And so I think the parts of the aid business that do care about democracy and give some modest support for, for democracy, democratic movements around the world, I think you, know, you could give them some credit for the progress on people fighting for their own democratic rights. You know, the Western support for movements like the democracy movement in Ukraine, for example, that's, that's a good example of. And even uh, Ethiopia, which is in very bad shape right now, but for a while there was some modest success uh, overthrowing the, the brutal Melish regime and getting, sort of creating a democratic opening. But then that uh, sadly turned out to be very temporary. So, you know, democracy is not, does not have a linear progression. It goes, you know, up and down. The long run trend is positive, but it's, has not been a real happy story lately. But you know, so far as the long run trend is positive, you could give some some modest recognition to some aid efforts and to some other Western democracy promotion efforts in Africa and, and Eastern Europe and elsewhere. If you had a magic wand or if you were made president of the World Bank, what would be some things you'd like to see aid agencies do differently or how they might be restructured? to emphasize rights over the kind of rights of Western nations. My sort of gut reaction is if you appointed me president of the World Bank, I think the best first thing I could do would be to fire myself. <laughs> fire myself and anybody like me who claimed to have all the answers to the poverty of a very heterogeneous poverty problem all over the world. You know, sadly, I guess, you know, I've been working at this for uh, kind of 20 years now on the, the business of kind of trying to hold aid accountable, trying to direct some criticism to aid, trying to find alliances with other people who are of the same mindset, of which there have been many, many happy alliances and many, many good colleagues working for the same cause. And sadly, I have to say, you know, after 20 years, I, I can't see that we've made a lot of progress. I, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the problems of aid organizations are also political. It's not that they are bad people. It's not that they're kind of evil, you know, selfish people working for aid organizations. They're not. They're very good people and they're very, quite altruistic in what they do. But they also are very constrained politically by the political environment. You know, the, the World Bank and USAID are forced to count out uh, West to U.S. foreign policy or U.K. foreign policy in the case of the World Bank also. And they are not allowed to to do what they what they would like to do either. So. Uh, with those political constraints going on, then the, the effort to sort of get accountability at the World Bank or elsewhere, it's just a really difficult, probably not very likely, probably not very hopeful situation. And so I don't, I actually don't think the World Bank is, is a very big part of the answer in the future. For listeners, I think especially maybe students or uh, recent graduates who really care about addressing global inequality, what are some of the ways that you would encourage them to get involved? What kinds of things could they do to help shift away from this sort of benevolent colonialist mentality and actually empower local people around the world to solve their own problems? Well, since you and I are both in academia, let's give a plug for academics. <laughs> I think the great thing about academics is they really do have free speech. <laughs> the, the tenure system and academic freedom really do give us free speech. And so 
academics are sort of like the only people that you can expect to really speak their minds with, with without political interests, unless they themselves are working as consultants for the World Bank. That, that's more problematic. But if they aren't, you know, if they're really just giving their views, then I think being, being an academic is a way to kind of, you know, both do research on what the solutions are, but, you know, also after you get tenure, then you can start being a, you know, sharing some of your research in more public forums for general audiences, campaigning for kind of good ideas and trying to shoot down bad ideas. And I think that can be something that, uh, you know, can be quite satisfying as a, as a career for many people, including especially people from the developing countries themselves. You know, I, I really get inspired when I see some of the students that we have at NYU from from Africa and Asia and Latin America and all the great things that they are doing. So that's that's idea number one, be an academic. <laughs> I think another area that is kind of under underappreciated is just kind of the world of advocacy. So I think that so much of the aid, aid world is concentrated on trying to do the technical solutions that are very concrete, that if I can just send a socket off to, off to Africa, that's so much more concrete and appealing than the idea of advocating human rights in Africa or advocating against, you know, West, Western foreign policy supporting brutal autocrats in Africa. It's the, the advocacy sounds so not concrete, so intangible that people may not at first find it as appealing. But remember, oftentimes the tangible things are not going to go anywhere because they, because as we've been talking, the problems are really political and not technological. The problem is not a shortage of technology. It's not a shortage of experts. It's a shortage of rights. Those who are willing to join the sort of advocacy world campaigning for more rights for people in, in all dimensions, you know, as it's influenced by Western foreign policy, as it's influenced by aid, it's influenced by just the climate of ideas, just by the support, international support for persecuted activists in poor countries. All those things, I think, I think that's a very much underappreciated area for action that students could get very much involved in. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Listeners can keep up with ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information, you can visit bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Our producers are Chris Cavera and Marco Mendoza with sound engineering by Alexander Schweitzer and Marco Mendoza. This episode was researched and written by Carrie Hanlon.